my great honor to welcome all of you today to the A.R. Davis Memorial Lecture. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Australian Society for Asian Humanities. I am John Foncobalas. I'm currently serving as president of the society. Before we begin, I would like to begin by acknowledging the fact that I am speaking from the land of the Benegal people of the Eora Nation, and I would like to express my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, as well as all First Nations peoples throughout Australia and the rest of the world. Organized by the Australian Society for Asian Humanities, the A.R. Davis Memorial Lecture is held annually in commemoration of A.R. Bertie Davis, um, who was the founding professor of Oriental Studies at the University of Sydney. He was a leading scholar and, and academic in Asian studies in Australia. And he was also the builder of the East Asian Library collection at the University of Sydney, which we all greatly value. I first heard of Bertie Davis when I was a graduate student at Berkeley uh, from the dissonant poet Gaojun from Taiwan, who had been one of his postgraduate students here at the University of Sydney. He spoke very highly of Professor Davis as a scholar and a gentleman. Uh, I only knew several Australian academics in, in those days. Uh, Professor Davis, I also knew of um, Professor Leo Tsun Ren, uh, Professor Rafe de Crepeny, um, and also Mabel Lee. So uh, he really was one of the, the first Australian academics that I had heard of. This event this year um, is kindly sponsored by the University of Sydney's China Studies Center. Um, and uh, it will be chaired by Professor Guo Yingjie of the University of Sydney, who is the deputy director of the professional organization of Asianists in the country. It's dedicated to spreading knowledge of and about Asia with membership open to anyone who is interested in joining us. Just send a, an email to our honorary treasurer, that's Dr. Jimmy Gong. We publish a journal, JOSA, which is a peer reviewed journal on Asian humanities that has a particular interest in research on which is based on Asian language sources. On a personal note, uh, Dr. Barbara Hendrishka was my senior colleague at the University of Melbourne. Uh, she's taught many different courses on Chinese studies, including Chinese history, classical Chinese language, philosophy, and religion at the University of Melbourne, the University of New South Wales, and Macquarie University. She was a member of this group of scholars around Anna Sedell, who studied Taoism at the University of Kyoto. With that, um, I will be handing over the, the, the meeting to the chair. Um, this is Professor Guo Yingjie of the University of Sydney, the Deputy Director of the China Studies Center. Professor Guo received his BA and his MA degrees from Shanghai International Studies University and his PhD from the University of Tasmania. Prior to joining the University of Sydney as chair professor in 2014, he had taught at Shanghai International Studies University, the University of Tasmania and the University of New England and finally the University of Technology, Sydney. His research focuses on cultural nationalism, cultural identities, and discourses of class in contemporary China. Professor Guo will now give the formal introduction of the speaker and her topic this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Good evening, everybody, if you're in Sydney. Good morning, if you are in Europe or other places. Um, I'm not sure about the time. Yeah, I'm extremely pleased to introduce you to you, my dear colleague, uh, Barbara Hendrishka. Uh, she has been teaching at the universities of Melbourne and New South Wales 
and he's now a research fellow at the China Studies Center at the University of Sydney. She has published extensively on, on Taoism. Her research monographs uh, include Taoist perspectives on knowing the future, uh, selections from the scripture on great peace, uh, the Taiping Jing. Um, another research monograph is on the scripture on great peace, the Taiping Jing, and the beginning of Taoism. Um, those two books were published in 2017 and 2006. Um, Barbara is one of the people in Australia, I think they belong to a, a endangered species. Uh, in the past, we had more sinologists. Now, <laughs> there, are, there are very few. So we, I, I feel we are very fortunate to have good colleagues like Barbara who continue to, to be active, who continue to research on Taoism and ancient uh, and past uh, texts like the Taiping Jing. In fact, she is a global leader in the research on the Taiping Jing. I think I, I have a lot of respect for her work. And without further ado, over to you, Barbara. Oh, before I forgot to mention something about the format of the, of the seminar. Um, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I, will, I will look at the questions on a first come and first serve the basis. Um, you can also raise your hand and that's fine too. So Barbara will have about an hour to speak and then we'll have half an hour for Q and A. Over to you, Barbara. Um, Okay. Um, thank you very much for these splendid introductions. Um, uh, thanks, of course, to the uh, Australian Society for Asian Humanities to uh, inviting me to this talk. Thanks to the China Study Center of this university for um, organizing it, and I suppose. Um, thank you to Professor Davis for getting us started um, at Sydney and at Sydney University uh, a while ago. And of course, thanks for all of you for listening um, and making this talk possible. The topic is Taoist plans. Uh, this is my first Zoom um, performance. So please pardon me for being a bit slow regarding all these different possibilities. Here we are. Um, the title is Taoist Plans for a Millennium of Great Peace. Taoist. Taoism. The origins of the Taoist religion lay in the breakdown of the Han Empire in the late second century CE when religious practitioners attracted and organized groups of people whose livelihood the state could no longer save God. Taoist leaders promised their followers health, longevity, chances for immortality, and harmonious and well-balanced social and cosmic relations. For believers, the future would be an age of millennial bliss. We will focus on the perspective of the corpus of texts in the Taiping Jing. Uh, its language and subject matter point to the second century CE. The received text was edited in the 6th century under the auspices of the newly founded Chen Dynasty. We have no sources on how the 2nd century text originated, unless 
he decided to seek guidance from various materials on great peace mentioned in official sources. The term great peace became a slogan during the reign of the first emperor of the Qin dynasty in the late third century BCE and continued to accompany political deliberations. One trace leads to the second century great peace movement. Its initiators followed certain teachings that were promoted in the Taiping Jing. The influential historian Fan Ye proposing centuries later, they were familiar with the Taiping Jing. Whether this is true or not, we, we cannot prove. We don't have any sources. Um, it's possible, but it doesn't have to be. Their movement developed into the Yellow Turban Uprising that ended the Han Empire. Thus, for centuries, people shunned the term great peace. The most convincing trace, in my opinion, leads to the celestial master community situated at the empire's border in today's Sichuan. Here, Taoist practitioners founded an organization that has endured and today is still the religion's main representative. Led by a celestial master, believers were assured they, and only they, stood a good chance of reaching the millennial world of great peace. In the turmoil of the third century, after the country's division and several foreign invasions, the celestial masters spread their beliefs China-wide and continued transmitting religious writings. We may assume typing gene materials were among them. The received typing jinx major layer A are talks between a heaven sent celestial master and a group of disciples or students. That's about two thirds of the text. It's a long text and it's been divided up into layers. Layer B uh, talks about uh, a practitioner who wants to become immortal. So it's the search for uh, individual immortality. And it contains talks between the practitioner and uh, celestial deities. They are C, are materials of a later date. Um, uh, concerning uh, Taoist movements in the 5th and 6th century. In function and appearance, uh, the master in layer A does not resemble the personages who under this title led the Taoist congregation. The Taiping Jinx celestial master is depicted as a teacher in the footsteps of Confucius. He confronts the students who approach him with questions, answers their queries and objections and lectures. He demands students take notes so they can publish the outcome. As heaven's spokesman, his intellectual range was limited. Therefore, as we will see, the authors delegated doubtful proposals to the students. I just try to. Um, the idea was that I would become visible. Of course, I can't handle that. All right. Um, we go on with this slide, um, although it doesn't really have much to do with what I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. Um, master and students talked about how to bring about the millennium of great peace and simultaneously prevent the apocalypse. Millennium is here as fits the general use of the term, a divinely induced era of perfect bliss. The conditions for its arrival are the text's main topic. Some are situated in a cosmic timetable that is left vague. What is crucial is heaven's support. Heaven wants it, but being far from almighty can only initiate rumor of great peace once social order agrees with natural and cosmic 
or in other words, heaven's rules. Therefore, simply put, only a well-governed world can become one of great peace. Master and students proceed in what scholars of Christianity have termed a post-millennium mode. Instead of passively waiting for divine decisions, the pre-millennial mode, they plan the millennium. Christian post-millennial ideas see the second coming of Jesus Christ happening only when Christian ethics prevail. Ideas of a millennium have been and still are very important until today in the formation and spread of religious movements everywhere in the world. In China, from the third to the sixth century, both Taoist and Buddhist groups approached potential believers with promises of being selected for inhabiting the realms of great peace. This while, the rest of the world would meet with destruction. The Taiping Jing's ideas differed, as if dominated by Han dynasty, Han dynasty ideas of all under heaven, the world, under the rulership of heaven's son, the emperor. For the Taiping Jing, great peace was universal, as it had been for the first emperor of the Qing dynasty. It could only be achieved by a joint effort and would benefit everyone. In a utopian fashion, the text argued that for great peace to exist, everyone and everything took part in its creation and would enjoy its benefits. So the master and the students discussed how to prevent distress and redirect attitudes and procedures to agree with natural processes. Why, for instance, ruin a family's livelihood to bury the dead? Why practice female infanticide and thereby endanger the cosmic balance between male and female and young and yin? Or given the desperate need of others, why should anyone be permitted not to share her belongings? The discussion of these issues took place in steps. The master made students aware, and once they became concerned, both sides agreed uh, on solutions. The result amounted to plans that were put in writing and thus fit for distribution. This procedure would, as was suggested, bring about the millennium. In this respect, the type of is not isolated at all. Uh, the idea that once something was put in writing, the agenda was there and everyone could see it, that this fact would then uh, almost automatically lead to implementing uh, what the writing said was rather common in uh, late Han dynasty times. The range of the Taiping Jing's plans reflects its probable origins. The investigated issues were of visible local and regional impact. Although seen as decisive, the emperor and his court remained remote. Solutions were practice-oriented, specific, and not necessarily coherent. Certain contradictions stemmed, as we must assume, from conflicting authorial perspectives. Others arose from teachings that combined the religious dependency on heaven, Confucius-derived moral guidelines, and psychophysiological practices for nourishing the self that reach back to the fourth and third century before the coming era. Once the millennium had arrived, all would be in place. Heaven's rules would be followed family and social hierarchy respected, and everyone would be in harmony with the spiritual forces and live alone. This paper stems from mixed interests. One point relates to religious and less directly intellectual history. 
There's a contradiction in terms, one could argue, to plan for the millennium. However, some Taoists did just that. Arguably, their view on the relationship between humans and superhuman powers can be called emancipated. Another point is the alternative access to the, uh, the typing jing provides to the empire's concerns. Its language and intellectual sophistication are not those of the scholar officials, oh, very, very distant from those of the scholar officials who ran the empire and shaped its image. However, interests and worries are quite similar. Or in other words, from reading the type in Jing, one gains the impression that the people actually like living in an empire. So a third point, as will become clear, at least to some of you, is the fact that I have lived in Beijing in the mid-1970s and again in 1979. Our focus here is one example of how the Taiping Jing authors planned the millennium. They devised techniques to guarantee the unimpeded and reliable flow of communication between the sovereign, his administration, and the population under his rule. With such plans, uh, uh, such plans had utopian aspects. Yes, uh, but. They stemmed from realistic views of the social and political stratification. Thoughts on the grounding for this stratification are the paper's second topic. Arguing from a psychological perspective, the authors explained how control and the fear it instilled were the conditions for social order. So first topic, plans for the flow of information. While official communication had complex political repercussions, its procedures were clear, even for someone without experience in central affairs. Master and students observed and fully appreciated that the information exchanged between the population and the administrators and between administrative levels was in writing as was indeed the case in the late Han Empire. Master and students explained that hurdles in this communication prevented informed political decision-making. They also dwelt on the quality of what was reported. Information had to be true, to be of use. One background, or the major background, for these concerns lay in the prognostication studies that were an essential component of Han dynasty ideology. It caught the scholar officials proposed that natural irregularities were heaven sent messages and warnings. Should humans not take heed, they would perish. The master was in complete agreement In, in his words, in all under heaven, there are myriads of disasters, unusual and irregular events and calamities, all calamitous upheavals of heaven and earth and yin and yang have a message. They're sometimes not observed in the country's capital, but in the province. At other times, uh, not in the province, but a commandery and so on. And not in this hamlet, but in that. But the type in Jing loves lists. It's as if information would thereby uh, gain some general validity. We'll see quite a number of lists as we, as we go through this talk. Um, therefore, in the past, when the worthy and wise reigned and had concern for the common people down below. They were happy to hear news of unusual events so that they could tune into heaven's feelings and earth's intentions 
to stabilize their person. Again, a good ruler, a successful ruler, will stabilize his person before he does anything else. Um, that means he'll be healthy and um, look after himself, and then the rest will hopefully follow. Um, their reign was therefore always secure, no upheavals, balanced and in harmony with heaven. News of unusual events would usually reach uh, the authorities through written reports. Uh, the term to submit a letter to the throne covers all writings that were submitted to the emperor. The master called it a criminal offense to impede their flow. This condemnation is in accord with the type in Jing's thoughts on solving issues by submitting and publicizing ideas. Enormous impact is ascribed to a petition by the population at large. If the diverse plans of all 12,000 countries, that's the world, consists of that many countries, were to be submitted in petition as one identical document, heaven's pluma would be bound to naturally follow suit and become pervasive. In other words, uh, should humans get together and really follow one identical line, heaven would have to or have to obey, would have to do as uh, humans ask it to do. Um, according to the same principle, individuals must communicate what they know. To have solid knowledge of, in this passage, essential Tao and essential virtue, but be unwilling to convey it to the ruler in the form of a memorial is completely respectless and a crime not to be part of it. Some hurdles for the flow of information were not in the master's reach. He observed that at court, all access to the sovereign was under the control of his entourage, but he could do nothing about it. His active interest lay at the grassroots where he saw restrictions put in place by a severe county head. County head is the lowest uh, centrally commissioned official. In other words, uh, he is a career official. He can rise in bloody. Um, the master speaking. I'm afraid the scholars and good people who wish to work hard for the suburb and submit writings to make known what heaven and earth have to say may in the hinterland far away of the capital meet with the disdain of the county head who will afterwards use this event to harm such people. The students compared facing the county head to meeting a wolf or tiger when far from human dwellings. In such a situation, one would freeze, unable to utter a word. The master added that in communal life, such cases happen often. Even someone with good intentions dares not address the ruler, thereby dull is cut off. Now, with only one rigid and rigorous man in a hamlet where he regularly maintains order, no one in the whole hamlet dares talk for fear of harm from this man's vengeance. Even in a family regularly administered by a rigid and rigorous person with a warlike temper, no one in the whole family dares talk. In the present age, this has intensified. Few want to send writings that convey information. After the problem has been defined, the master proposed practical solutions. When insecure, one can send writings by employing someone who travels in the right direction by foot or on a merchant's cart. Or 
can deliver them in person, clearly stating family and style name. Um, this idea and principle, again, was certainly not something that was had its origin in the type in Jing, it was a common Han Dynasty and ongoing. Uh, the emperor, the ruler, enhances his legitimacy by enabling communication. Could almost speak of an ideology of openness. He must accept complaints and suggestions to be seen as a proper ruler and get good marks by the historians for what he's been doing. Um, the master uh, continues, a group of, ideally, a group of apt scholars and those worthy and bright, his words, of one province would get together, write the letter and submit it from another province or depending on the situation from another command or county, district and hamlet. Once the letter was accepted, the writer could expect a reward and even employment. And again, this was customary. Um, once a memorial had indeed reached the emperor and there was some positive opinion about it, uh, the writer of this memorial could expect a reward. Another suggestion concerned administrative measures. The master proposed that the sovereign uh, because of his interest in information and the difficulties of obtaining it, should actively increase its flow by installing official collection points, termed cabinets for the arrival of great peace. The county head okay, would administer the intake. He would order his staff to organize the collected manuscripts uh, according to their subject matter, remove bad ones, and discard duplicates. The result he would put forward to the sovereign. The cabinet's aim was broad. They were meant to attract everyone's and all communications. Now, if lowly subjects and officials find a way to submit to the Lord what they have to say, they let the sovereign receive rare predictions, unusual texts, and unique recipes to keep him secure for a long time. Heaven and earth can thus spread what they have to say. So through communicating their valuable sayings, the lower ranks of the hundred surnames relieve heaven and earth of anxiety and help their Lord gain insight. The decisive argument for implementing the master's suggestions was the list of events that would occur should the status quo be left in place. Since the division between heaven and earth, the disaster of inheriting and transmitting trespasses has derived from the fact that uh, communicating events did not extend to the various reports that were collected among the people. When one place has a calamity or regular event, but the head of another place comes to deal with it, those close to the head of the first place are afraid of speaking and jointly they cover things up. Thereby they cut off what heaven and earth have said so that it cannot reach the sovereign. Severe harm is done, heaven is made anxious and there are more disasters. This is to be condemned. Just when I mean, the story is, is, is easy. Imagine there is a hail storm. It's an irregular event that uh, does much damage to the harvest in place A. It's, um, there's really a lot of damage. Uh, so the report reaches uh, the upper strata and they send the head of place B for an investigation. Someone must have caused the hailstorm by improper behavior, misconduct. And usually the culprit is the head of the local administration. So it's his fault. Um, so it must be investigated what he did wrong. Logically, the people in place A, who, where he now has been for a while and who depend on him, 
I will not speak up. Um, in consequence, uh, the investigation uh, will be uh, pointless. And this is obviously the, the regular event in these cases. The master's plans went in two directions. On the one hand, they directly addressed the people, the subjects, their conduct mattered. On the other hand, they outlined an administrative policy. This twofold approach is characteristic of how the typing gene proposed to. The centralized administration was becoming inadequate, and regional initiatives in support of the dynasty or intent on its breakdown were increased. Endangered in two respects. One, as has been shown, was its cessation due to pressures of personal interest that were enhanced by the local power structure. Another concerned the truth of what was communicated. For the modern reader, repeated and energetic warnings to submit writings as a group, seem to combine both points. However, the master's thoughts usually went in the direction of the report's veracity. Deliberations must be collected. If it is only one man speaking, he may lie off swinging. Or returning to the issue of local pressure, the master argued that individuals being embedded in their networks will provide information only as it suits them. Therefore, he proposed. Writings submitted by seven people may be trustworthy. When eight, they get close to the truth. When nine, they're close to being reliable, and when 10, we almost find the truth. The ideal and frequently envisaged scenario is the following. For this reason, we let masses of people of high and low rank, be they old or young, worthy or unworthy, men or women, down to serves, deliberate together so that nobody can act deceitfully and let the public serve their personal interest. On the same grounds, the master saw particular value in what he termed threefold writings that were put together by three distinct groups of people with conflicting interests who would, in consequence, control each other. The more they fear each other, the less they dare speak thoughtlessly and hide things. Therefore, once writings have been submitted from three places, that is by the county officials, the local population and travelers, and the three agree with each other, there is not the slightest error. Certain threefold writings were to be collected in a particular file and serve as records of local personages. This term is used in official histories. It was indeed uh, one of the uh, tools of uh, the imperial administ administration. Through them, we know the good and bad and the conduct of everyone under heaven. These writings must not be discarded. Also, from now on, the county head will not deal with the people's personal records, 
as they are documented in threefold writings. That would be a, a reduction of the power and impact of the, of the county head, or at least there would be some competition to this uh, impact. So threefold writings have a significant impact on public security. Should it be the case that threefold writings have been set in motion, nobody must dare intercept them. Then heaven and earth will be happy. The disasters and dangers of the sovereign inheriting and transmitting trespasses will have largely been overcome and all under heaven will be in great peace. Um, perhaps a few some words on the what's been translated here as inheriting and transmitting trespasses. Uh, this is a typing gene term, doesn't occur anything else. The same, by the way, holds true for the threefold writings, the Sandow Shin Shu. Uh, that term is found only in the typing gene. Um, the inheriting and transmitting, I've added the of trespasses, um, has been uh, compared to um, Christian ideas of original sin. The idea is that humans from the beginning uh, did not obey heaven. Uh, they did not follow its rules. Um, they trespassed. Um, these trespasses were never forgotten, but uh, they, they, they came about and uh, they created a load, and this load increased. And at present, it is actually so big that it is what we could really call the cause of the uh, approaching apocalypse. Therefore, basically, uh, the authors of the typing gene argue that reforms are necessary in all, in all respects, so that this load will not increase. And once the increase has stopped, there is a chance that it will also decrease. And that's sort of the reason behind uh, many of the uh, arguments uh, put forward in this text. Another way of reading this uh, uh, term has been uh, that it's just a resembles uh, the traditional Chinese idea that uh, ancestors are very important for the uh, well being of a family or a clan as that a family uh, moves on and uh, will be able to rely on good deeds done by the family members in the past or will suffer from uh, what uh, their ancestors have done wrong. So concluding this part of the talk, the Typing Jing authors took all inclusive communication as a prerequisite for a better future or in contemporary language, the era of great peace. Also, they suggested private and administrative means to involve as many as possible in exchanging information and opinions. So in both respects, their plans suited the idea that great peace was universal. Now our next topic, fear as the prerequisite of order. When discussing communication, the authors frequently refer to fear. In fear of local power holders, individuals refrained from writing reports. In fear of the community, they hesitated to report events as they happened and would report what did not occur. In fear of friends and neighbors, they refrained from disclosing details. However, throughout the type in Jing, the master praised students for being fearful. In his view, 
Fear signified their respect for heaven and would induce them to stick to its rules. The master's praise for fear was grounded in religious and cosmic principles. A superior person of high worth fears all events, whether significant or not. An average person fears them by half, and a lowly person has no fear at all. Regarding fear, the superior person turns to himself and no one else. His heart opens and his mind stretches out, so they contain everything. He knows the source of primordial pluma and what is as it is, honors heaven and values earth. The sun, the moon, the stars, five phases, four seasons, and the myriad things do not exist without reason. And another group, ghosts, spirits, numinous beings, wind, rain, thunder, and lightning do not come about in vain. For all these entities, there are spirits and chiefs. That's um, here we go, Jim Trump, chiefs. All these entities are just like humans who, once warned, are afraid and dare not move thoughtlessly. We have patience for that. <laughs> um, well, it's always it's always interesting when uh, modern um, commentators annotators uh, see the need to an, add a negation uh, as they did here. It doesn't happen that often, but happens. Um, obviously, the, the text doesn't have uh, the negation, and the first editor uh, of modern editor of the text in, in 1960 didn't see a need to add the book. Um, that would, without the boo, um, the heart mind that is in the right shape op, um, doesn't contain anything, nothing. Um, in um, fourth, third century discussions, uh, there was room for, there was a lot was said on the need for the heart mind to be empty which mainly meant that the heart-mind uh, was supposed to be without desire, without wishes, without opinions. But there were also groups or individuals who argued it shouldn't store anything. It should be completely empty. It should not even store knowledge. It should really be completely empty, yes. Um, and uh, these two groups had discussions um, in some text from that period. So it would be possible that uh, someone in this text actually said, no, the heart mind might be completely empty and then we obviously don't need, um, don't need the negation. So the text reads easier with the negation, so maybe, maybe we need it. Um, uh, this is the superior person of high worth. Uh, then the average person is unaware of primordial puma, what is as it is, and heaven's spiritual realms. A lowly person only knows how to plow a field and maintain his or her family. From a taxonomic perspective, the master's thoughts resembled those of Confucius, who suggested the gentleman was in awe of three subjects of which the small-minded men knew nothing. The word here translated as to fear refers to a fearsome object and the reaction to such an object. It is the same character as that used for the fear caused by tiger and wolf or the card he had. However, the translation to respect is often appropriate, as in the passage at hand. A person of high worth in the Tai Ping Jing uh, was in official employment or eligible for high-ranking official positions. 
So the passage conveys that administrative tasks were best fulfilled by being aware of the universal interconnectedness of issues. I mean, this is close to being uh, central to uh, Taoist political philosophy, actually. And in this sense, the celestial master was pleased to see students fearful. A short dialogue approached this universal interconnectedness and the fear it may provoke from a practical angle. The students raised the topic of suppression, control, and the creation of fear as being the means for curing an illness. The most successful recipe being the one that activates heaven's spirits, since they are far more powerful than the spirits which cause the illness. Therefore, the students conclude. Foolish, uh, foolish as we are, this is what we think. Only because they instill fear by suppression and control can they heal. The master likes the remark and proposes that according to heaven's arrangement, everything in existence is under a particular chief. We've just seen that in the other passage uh, quoted above. So everyone's fate depends on someone. The life of domestic animals, for instance, relies on humans. Heaven's overall reign depends on every single thing being subordinate to a chief. The students then ask for permission to raise what they call a risky and pretentious question. Nowadays, should a bandit assault people, he will bring everyone under his rule. How can you think of him as a chief under heaven's command? The master responds, such bandit-like behavior the county had will end by prosecuting it as a crime. The student's question he calls impertinent. How can they propose such a chief to be appointed by heaven? However, they raise another unusual question. Now, do only each of the million things have a chief, or do heaven and earth also have one? The master calls the problem mysterious and far-reaching. It was a serious problem in his mind. He tentatively proposes that the pole star heads heaven, look high up, and Mount Kunlun on earth. Same reason again, pretty high, uh, which makes little sense. He thereby admits he has no, um, he has no solution. The issue concerns the cosmic role of heaven. When faced with all under heaven, the world, its power may be absolute. But the approaching apocalypse will end heaven and earth as well as humankind. The students approach the issue of curtailment and control from still another angle. They want to know the reason for the rule that only a fully developed animal must be used as material for preparing drugs. This was the rule in early and medieval China. In answering, the master reminds them of the universal system of dependencies steered by heaven that one can observe in natural processes just as in social events. When confronted with the subject's reckless murder, its chief, through anger, would upset the cooperation between heaven and humans that was essential for the arrival of great peace. However, the students insist. Now, how can small animals impact heaven and bring turmoil and bewilderment to its government? To explain heaven's reaction, the master describes how the sovereign should cope with a local case of violence, no matter how distant, how distant, once it had come to his attention. The case should be thoroughly investigated and end with the culprit's punishment. 
This explanation makes proper use of the principle of correlation that allows observers to draw conclusions in both directions, in that natural processes become manifest from scrutinizing social political processes and the other way around. Master and students depict control and fear from enough angles to propose fear was of moral relevance. The county head and other strong men mentioned in the first part instilled but themselves lacked fear and were therefore not worthy. They had no insight into how the give and take of cosmos derived mutual dependency worked. Subjects who from fear conveyed accurate information did the right thing. To assign to fear the power to motivate actions helps explain problems and provide solutions in the exchange of information. However, the typing jing's interest is not an investigation into moral philosophy. It seeks to give practical advice for avoiding the approaching cataclysm. Therefore, the master's thoughts on moral motivation are situational in principle. Regarding good government, for instance, he proposes suppression and control should take turns with the practice of virtue, just as the years seasons differ. He adds that a ruler would do well to increase the range covered by practicing virtue. When introducing plans for more egalitarianism and social balance, or the protection and prolongation of life, he reminds students and readers that humans are heaven's children and will instinctively be grateful and cooperative once aware of this fact. The ruler will then easily succeed in establishing order by virtue. Conclusion. Millennialist, sorry, millennialist expectations played an essential role in the origin of the Taoist religion. For the Tai Ping Jing, the millennium of great peace was to reach beyond the congregation of believers and save the whole world from the imminent apocalypse. While cosmic forces and heaven's support were prerequisites, the millennium had an essential man-made component. It would not arrive unless social order among humans reflected their obedience to the rules manifested in the course of nature. Therefore, the Taiping Jing authors devised plans for consolidating social order, among them ways to guarantee pervasive, continuous, and reliable communication between different strata. Without it, the sovereign, lacking information, was unable to reign successfully. In developing these plans, the authors analyzed the various aspects of being fearful that they saw as crucial for promoting and modifying the flow of reliable information. In arranging these thoughts, they defined being fearful as the psychological and moral basis for establishing order. Thank you.